Peace and Justice Center, and I work with the Global Peace Collective, which is um, the collective at the Peace Center. We, we have uh, groups that are uh, issue areas, and uh, the Global Peace Collective is one of them, and um, we work uh, for global peace, we're anti-war, we work for a just foreign policy, reducing the military budget, and uh, basically becoming a better neighbor than we are in the world right now. Uh, I want to welcome all the students who are here tonight. There's a, I don't know, uh, we want to raise your hand, all of you who are with the class. <laughs> Most of the people here are with a class at CU, and I'm so glad that you're here because this is a very important issue and could have a, a huge impact on you and your generation in the future. Uh, so it's very good to see you here. Uh, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about how to avoid a war with North Korea, and we have three panelists, and Ron will introduce them in a minute. We have to be out of here by 8 o'clock. Uh, we actually probably have to start gathering up the chairs around quarter of 8. It's just the library closes at 8. I know some of the students wanted to talk to some of the people on the panel. We'll do that outside afterwards. So if you, uh, you know, you, we'll just kind of have a circle and people can talk to people or talk to people individually. I'm also willing to be happy to talk to people as well. Oh, I want to mention a couple of other things. I handed out our brochure for the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center, and we have work in a number of different areas. As I mentioned, global peace. We work in the area of so social justice, economic justice, uh, and nuclear weapons and nuclear cleanup of Rocky Flats, which is about 12 miles down the road uh, south of here, I guess. Is that right? Yes. South of here. Uh, we also uh, would like to get a critical media uh, literacy project uh, going, which is looking at what we see in the media and how to have an a understanding of the forces behind the media and uh, how to judge what we actually see and hear in the TV and the, the newspaper. So love to have some students if you're interested. The contact information is on the brochure for all these collectives. Uh, so we welcome people to get involved. We welcome all of you to get involved. So, uh, welcome. Uh, if any of the people who just came want to be on our email list, just come over and see me afterwards. And we welcome you to be involved with us as well. So I'm now going to turn this over to Ron, uh, and he's going to facilitate the panel tonight. We have Ron Forth over on the left, Tom uh, Mayor in the middle and Dan Winters on the right hand side. I'm never on the right. <laughs> <laughs> right here. But you're in the right. <laughs> yeah. Just briefly, um, thank you all for coming out here tonight to hear and discuss this important topic. Uh, Tom is a professor emeritus of sociology from CU, uh, a long time well known professor on, on campus. Uh, Dan has been a, a teacher at college, is in graduate school too? No, just, just college. Mm -hmm. Just college. <laughs> and Could Dan also uh, served in Korea uh, in a couple years after the Korean War, so he'll relate some information about that. And I'm a retired professor from the University of Texas School of Public Health in Houston. Tom will start by putting a, a large context for this whole issue, then I'll follow up with talking more about the, the history related to this, and then Dan will talk more about the, the current period. Uh, this is going to be a challenge for all three of us because we're used to talking for six hours nonstop, <laughs> and we're going to try and boil this down to 15 minutes each. So. Take it away, Tom. All right. <laughs> well, I, I want to put this in a very broad context. I feel that understanding the broad picture helps understand the particular nature of a situation. <laughs> and I think the broad picture of the Korean problem is framed by United States imperialism. Uh, 
Imperialism is much older than capitalism. It's a system by which one society systematically dominates another, and it's gone through many different forms. The uh, capitalist form of imperialism is quite different in, in the sense that imperialism has been very central for the every stage of the development of capitalism, and as capitalism has developed, the forms of imperialism associated with it have also uh, changed. Now, without going into a full history of that, uh, it's important to understand that the two great world wars of the, sec of the, of the 20th century were basically struggles about, uh, for imperial domination, basically struggles for which society uh, was going to be the imperial dominant one in, the, uh, in, uh, in Europe and in the world. Um, and uh, uh, imperial, the imperial had, imperialism had a number of, of real problems. One thing is that it created conflict between different uh, uh, societies and created the possibility of war. And second of all, it invited anti-imperial or anti-colonialist re revolution. Those are basic problems which uh, imperialism systematically had generated. Now, it was clear to most imperial, the United States merge, emerged from the Second World War as by far the strongest capitalist country in the world. No other country was even uh, close to it. And the other countries, Germany, France, uh, uh, um, uh, England, all recognized that if, we were, if, if the world was going to continue in the fashion which the, the, second, uh, which the 20th century had, that there's a good chance it was going to destroy itself, destroy capitalism, destroy the planet, perhaps. And so uh, basically an arrangement was arrived at, at the end of the Second World War, by which uh, the United States would be the single dominant uh, imperial power. Uh, in ex uh, it was recognized as such by all the other uh, uh, countries. In exchange for that, uh, the U.S. Would, uh, would treat capital from all the other countries as essentially e equivalent. It wouldn't discriminate against British, French, or German uh, capital. It would, it would uh, allow those all to proceed on the same uh, um, uh, basis. It would also undertake the task of repressing anti-capitalist uh, movements anywhere in the, uh, in the world. So that means that it would, uh, it would it would uh, uh, develop a very large military establishment to prevent the, not only the expansion of existing uh, uh, anti-capitalist or so-called socialist societies, but also the emergence of new ones, as might happen. Now, U.S. Uh, imperial hegemony was different than any previous imperial hegemony for a number of reasons. For one thing, it was, it was non-colonial. It did not rest upon uh, direct rule over other countries in the way which British imperialism had, say, ruled over, uh, or India, or French imperialism had ruled over uh, 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 Algeria. That didn't mean it ha didn't have control. It had great economic uh, power, and it had it, the capacity to intimidate uh, and, uh, and uh, countries by its military might and its control over a variety of different institutions. And it was the first truly global imperialism. Never before had there been a, an, an imperialism which covered the entire world, globe, and, and that, was, uh, uh, that was what it uh, was distinct, distinguish it. And it, it, was, it, it set itself the agenda of crushing all possible challenges. Now that meant, of course, that, the, uh, that there was already the Soviet Union uh, in existence. China was in the process of, uh, of, of, uh, of revolution, and so it had the problem of dealing with those. Now at that stage, at, at every stage, an imperialist system tries to figure out what its main challenges are and how to deal with them. Now in that, at the end of the Second World War and for several decades thereafter, there are two main challenges which the U.S. imperialism faced. The first was the possible expansion of, of, of Soviet and, uh, and uh, Chinese power. And secondly, in new capitalist, uh, as anti-capitalist revolutions which might occur around uh, the world. Now you have to recognize that the, the, the Second World War in particular 
created an upsurge of anti-capitalist uh, movements more or less all over the world. Almost every resistance movement to fascism was based, was also a movement against uh, capitalism, also a movement to try to get, establish a more egalitarian type of, uh, of uh, society. So therefore, U.S. imperialism at the, at, in the uh, first uh, several decades was concerned with con containing Soviet and Chinese power and repressing any further kinds of uh, revolutions which might occur, which did in fact occur in, uh, in uh, uh, Vietnam, in Korea, and in other countries as, uh, as well. Now, what, uh, what, how did the Korean problem uh, present itself to uh, the U United States? Well, uh, in Asia, the main challenge to U.S. imperialism was the, was the Chinese Revolution and the, the growth of, a, uh, of an anti-capitalist government uh, in China. Uh, Ch uh, Russia, um, in, um, the U.S. was... was uh, uh, preoccupied with the problem of how to deal with this kind of, of problem. Well, it's, it felt that if it, if it was going to repress uh, revolutionary movements in, China, in, in Asia and Chinese power, the growth of Chinese power in particular, it needed Japan as an ally. Now, uh, Japan, of course, had been uh, one of the major enemies of, uh, of, uh, in, in World War II, but shortly after, the U.S. policy basically switched from repressing uh, and crushing Japan, it needed to resurrect Japan as a power and as an ally in the, in the struggle to maintain uh, capitalism as a worldwide system. Now, that impacted Korea very much. Uh, Japan had been, had, had been controlling uh, Korea very repressively since uh, 1910 at least, if not uh, earlier. And uh, uh, during, uh, from the 1930s onward, there were strong anti-Japanese movements within, uh, within uh, Korea. And the uh, resistance to, uh, the, the resistance to uh, uh, Japan greatly revved up during the Second World War, many of the of the guerrilla resistors uh, made common cause with uh, the Chinese Revolution. It, it's thought that uh, about 200,000 uh, Korean people fought with the, uh, the Chinese against the Japanese during the, uh, the during the uh, uh, Second uh, World War, and uh, so that. Uh, Korea was very, very worried that the that uh, the that uh, um, a J Japanese power was going to be resurrect resurrected, and that was going to be uh, mean a further subjugation of uh, of uh, Korea. That was one of the things they were most worried about. Now, uh, for various reasons, uh, Korea was split, uh, but in between the north and the and the uh, and the and the south. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was actually mostly the U.S. decision to, to split it at the 38th uh, uh, parallel. There's no particular historical reason why that should happen. It was, uh, so the, uh, the Russians' uh, uh, troops came down to the 38th parallel and the U.S. Uh, took over on the, up to the 38th parallel. But the problem was there was a lot of anti-capitalist movement within uh, b below the 38th parallel in South Korea. The anti-capitalist movement was by no means uh, uh, confined to the northern part of uh, Korea. It was existed throughout uh, uh, Korea. And, uh, and therefore, there was the problem of, of uh, the, 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 a lot of repressive activity was uh, essential to establish a, a, a pro-capitalist regime in the southern part of, of um, Korea. So there, there'd been this uh, more or less civil war going on in Korea uh, since the 1930s, and uh, this revved up very much uh, after the, the uh, Second uh, World War. Now, you know, since the, the U.S. in establishing Korean power, uh, its rule in South Korea, was very much constrained to rely upon collaborators 
Why? Because everyone who wasn't, any, anyone who wasn't the collaborator had been more or less connected with the movement uh, for social change within, uh, within uh, uh, Korea. So there were very few uh, uh, people who were available who were, uh, on the one hand, strongly connected with the resistance, and on the other hand, um, um, uh, were, were pro-capitalists, because virtually everyone uh, wanted uh, some fundamental change. Korea was a very hierarchical society. A small, uh, a small share of the uh, of uh, the land was controlled by a very small share of the uh, of the uh, population. And so uh, the social revolution, it, it, even if you weren't a, a, a doctrinaire socialist, you did want to do something about number one, the inequality of uh, of land distribution, the exploitative nature of that land. Land, and the fact that Japan had been a dominant uh, in for for 50 years uh, before that, and you didn't want that to continue happening uh, uh, again. Two minutes. Two minutes. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, carrying that that that's a framework in which the Korean War broke out. There had been many many back and forths. Uh, 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 incursions back and forth. The one in, in June of 1950 was perhaps the largest one, but it wasn't qualitatively different from further, from previous back and forth which had been going on. Now in the present moment, U.S. Po policy is no longer confronted with the problem of repressing socialist revolution. Basically, uh, although socialism by, by no means dead, the, uh, the Soviet state socialist uh, form of highly centralized uh, socialism uh, controlled by a, a single party no longer has much credence, credence and is no longer uh, subject is no longer something which is, uh, appeals to many people. So the no, U.S. is no longer faced with the problem of crushing socialist revolutions, for the time being at least. What it is faced with the problem is how to constrain the power of rivals, the most important one of which are China and Russia. And I would submit to you that the, uh, much of the policy currently in Korea has to do not so much with Korea, but with the problem of how is it possible to constrain Russian and Chinese uh, power uh, and, and to establish and continue to establish U.S. world uh, uh, hegemony. I think I'll stop there, and there's much more to say, but I think that gives you basic broad picture. Thank you, Tom. Now I'll try and pick up on the history uh, from like the period of the Korean War. As Tom said that uh, the North, the leader of the North uh, in the period between 1945 and 1950 was a person named Kim Il-sung. And he had been one of the guerrilla fighters against the Japanese and uh, he was forced to go into Manchuria and then eventually into Russia uh, where he got some further education in Russia and also military training there as well. Uh, after the war, Second World War ended, he came back to uh, Korea to the area above the 38th parallel and he was the person recognized among the various guerrilla fighters as perhaps the more important or he was also perhaps the more politically astute as to how to gain power as well. And in the South, as Tom said, the United States was looking for somebody who would lead the South. And it would be hard to find anybody recognized in the South because most of those people were collaborators uh, with the Japanese during the period of occupation since 1910. There was a person named Sigmund Rhee who was, had been exiled from Korea long ago, uh, probably around 1915, 1920, somewhere in that range. And he was a staunch supporter of Korean independence from the Japanese. And he was working within the United States and within Europe to try and build support for Korean independence. Uh, he was also a very conservative person uh, with dictatorial tendencies and the United States thought this would be a good person to take back to 
South Korea and appoint him as the leader of South Korea. And so that happened. And he very quickly cracked down on any people who were talking about the reunification of Korea and uh, or the independence of Korea and killed tens of thousands of uh, more left-leaning people in the period between uh, 1945 and 1950. Uh, he was very violent. Kim Il-sung in the North, uh, also if there were opponents to his view, he was also brutal, but he didn't kill anywhere nearly the same number as that Sigmund Rhee was responsible for in the South. Uh, there were incursions back and forth, fighting going both ways. Then on June 25th, 1950, uh, a large incursion from the North came in, uh, and the United States decided this was the event that started what is called the Korean War, which ran from 1950 to 1953. And the forces from the North swept through the Korean Peninsula, and uh, eventually MacArthur did a landing in Incheon and uh, behind the Korean, North Korean forces. And the battle raged back and forth around 38th parallel. The UN uh, was the force that the United States was using uh, during this period uh, because the, the Security Council had gotten a resolution through the UN uh, for police action to drive the North Korean forces back above the 38th parallel. The only way that they were able to, the U.S. was able to get this resolution through the Security Council was that the Soviet Union was boycotting the session where this was done. They were boycotting the session in protest that the Chiang Kai-shek forces, which were on the island of Taiwan, they had been driven out of mainland China by the communists. Uh, so they still had the official uh, recognition as the government of China, according to the UN. And the Soviet Union thought that was pretty ridiculous when they were on a small island and Mao was the leader of the entire force of country on the mainland of three million square miles plus and probably at that time maybe five, six hundred million people somewhere. So uh, Soviet Union was protesting that and that's how this resolution went through the, the UN Security Council. Usually the Security Council is unable to get anything done if one of the rep five permanent representatives, which are this, were the Soviet Union, Russia, China, uh, France, and the uh, Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, China, France, Britain, Britain, and the United States. So if one of those five countries' interest was involved, usually they would veto something, so nothing usually got done in the Security Council. But because of the boycott, we had a police action. Uh, the United States led the uh, forces from a number of countries and uh, was just devastated the whole country, in particular the North, but the South was hit badly too. And the program MASH on TV talks a lot about the insanity of this period, and it was insane. Uh, there was a wonderful book written about called The Hidden History of the Korean War. Uh, which talked about this, the fighting during the first year, and this was by a, a famous reporter who you may or may not have heard of, named I.F. Stone. Uh, if you don't know him, look him up. Uh, he was a, an amazing radical reporter. Uh, his book was reissued in 1972, and it was entitled Korea, the United States First Vietnam. Because those two situations, the Vietnam experience is very much similar to what had happened in Korea. In Korea, the United States actually prevented a vote because we knew that Kim Il-sung was going to win an election and unite the country. Uh, we prevented it and supported Sigmund Rhee in the South. And the same thing happened in Vietnam where we prevented the Geneva Accords from being enacted that had been signed in 1954. And so, anyhow, 
uh, we bombed everything and we used over 32,000 tons of napalm in North Korea, most of the, and some in South Korea. The Koreans have no love for the United States. The devastation, Curtis LeMay, the, who was the head of the U.S. bombing forces, the Air Force in, in Korea at that time, said we bombed everything many times over. Uh, we killed three million people uh, out of a population at that time, maybe of 20 million or so. Uh, we, you know, just it was devastating. Uh, there was threats of A-bomb use. MacArthur wanted to use the A-bomb and he wanted to have the ability to dictate when he was going to use it. And as a result of that, Harry Truman, who was the president, uh, canned MacArthur because he was overstepping his bounds. He had to take orders from the president. Truman then threatened to use the A-bomb, but I chose never to do it. The president could do that, but a general could not do that. Uh, there was an armistice signed in 1953 which set up the 38th parallel as the boundary. And that armistice uh, called for withdrawal of forces beyond uh, both sides. So you have a demilitarized zone in between the North Korean forces and the South Korean U.S. forces. The United States has maintained a military presence in Korea ever since then. Uh, actually, the United States had a military presence in Korea after the Second World War and never went away. The Soviet Union had a military presence in North Korea until 1948 when they withdrew their troops. Um, anyhow, part of the, the armistice called for no introduction of any new types of weapons. In 1958, the United States introduced nuclear weapons to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and they stayed there till around 1981. Uh, because the, everything in North Korea was being bombed, they, North Korea is a very mountainous country, and they took advantage of the, the physical uh, structures there to build caves and to put their cities and their procedures underground as much as they could, as well as their military forces underground so that they couldn't be taken out by U.S. bombing. And they have maintained that to a large extent today. Uh, North Korea has been begging for a peace treaty to be signed for years. Uh, in 1976, the U.S. started conducting war games with South Korean forces. Uh, these war games are, according to the United States and South Korea, designed to prevent uh, an attack from North Korea or how to react if there were an attack. If you're sitting in North Korea and you see these major war games with tens of thousands of troops and planes and ships and things, you, you get kind of nervous about this. Is this a really an attack or is this just a, a practice attack? So North Korea has been trying to push for uh, a peace treaty and an end to these war games that have been conducted almost every year since uh, 1976. Uh, there was negotiations in 1994 that Jimmy Carter, who was the president between 1976 and 1980, uh, he was talking to the people in North Korea and the leaders in North Korea. And he said, yeah, they have a reasonable case that they want to pursue peace. So there was some negotiations that were worked out uh, between the Clinton administration and the North Koreans' forces that North Korea would not try and weaponize any of the plutonium that they were uh, getting as byproducts of their attempt to develop nuclear energy. Uh, I have a headline from the Long Not Times call in 1990, December of 1994, showdown with North Korea. Uh, this you know, could have been written almost any time <laughs> since then as well. We've always had showdowns. Uh, the United States and North Korea uh, pretty much agreed and kept the agreement from 1994 to about 1998. The agreement called for the United States to uh, build two light water nuclear reactors which did not allow uh, weaponized plutonium to be produced as a byproduct to replace the North Korean nuclear reactors that they were working on. Uh, 
the United States didn't follow through with that. Uh, we also promised to provide 500,000 uh, barrels of oil uh, every year, and that fell through after a while, or the de deliveries were delayed. So North Korea also cheated. Uh, they still maintain some reaction, nuclear reactors uh, developing uh, plutonium that could be converted to weapon grade plutonium. So that thing broke down in 2002 when George Bush labeled North Korea as part of the axis of evil. Uh, Iran, Iraq, and uh, North Korea were the axis of evil. This is all before you were born, or many of you were born. <laughs> no, not many. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, since 2002, North Korea has been working on the development of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. And they have also tons of conventional rockets in place underground, protected from an attack, right? So they still are trying to achieve a peaceful resolution because North Korea knows if there is an attack on them, they will be wiped out. They, they know they cannot stand up to a full-fledged U.S. nuclear attack. They don't want to fight. But if they're going to be attacked, they're going to make sure that South Korea, Japan, and U.S. forces that are in South Korea will pay a price because they have tens of thousands of rockets many of whom will not be taken out by any U.S. attack because they are protected under, underground. They have the capacity with conventional weapons to do incredible damage to South Korea, particularly to Seoul, which is close by. Two minutes. Okay. The North Korea also is looking at nuclear weapons, though, and the development of ballistic missiles. Uh, they looked at what happened to Iraq, they looked at what happened to Libya. These both had uh, nuclear weapons programs that they gave up. And North Korea concluded that the only way that the Kim dynasty could remain in place is to have a countervailing threat to the United States, that there would be a, a major price to be paid. Uh, the development of uh, these nuclear weapons they're still in a very preliminary phase. I mean, th their weapons are uh, impressive uh, if you're using the Hiroshima bomb as a comparison point. But uh, you know, the Hiroshima weapon was small potatoes compared to what North, uh, the United States and China and Soviet Union have today. The ballistic missiles, uh, they don't seem to have the heat shields that necessary to uh, have their weapons uh, not burn up in space. But if you've got nuclear weapons, maybe uh, that can also do a lot of damage. But they don't want to fight, and they know that they will not attack. And the U.S. knows that there's a price to be paid, though, if the United States were attacked. Simulations have been run by the U.S. military. <coughs> And the U.S. military has concluded there are no winners to this situation. We don't want to do this. And I think what Trump and Kim uh, Jong-il uh, are posturing for their populations. Uh, a small mistake could occur, but I don't think either North Korea or the United States wants a military attack. But what has happened is that the United States has been able to put anti-ballistic missile weapons in South Korea. Now, they really wouldn't be very useful against North Korean missiles or rockets, but they would be very useful against China. And this gets to Tom's point, and my, my belief is that China is the real target of the U.S. action. North Korea is just such a small issue. In theory, if we just let it go, and don't pay attention to these two leaders just playing like they're first grade kids or kindergarten, uh, we will not see a war unless there is some accidental mistake. But, so, uh, but 
North Korea is not really the target, but it, it sells newspapers big time. It raises the fear level, uh, helps build up the military industrial complex. We have to have these weapons and now we're able to sell more weapons. South Korea and Japan now are talking about the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, so uh, I will quit now then. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ron. As he mentioned, I was stationed in Korea. In fact, it's uh, in the Army. And it's uh, now 60 years since I left Korea, which sort of seems hard to believe. Of course, I was only three years old at the time. <laughs> so that might account for it. Uh, yeah, I, well, I start off with uh, current events, I guess, you know. This is Sunday's Daily Camera newspaper. And it says, Tillerson, this is a quote from Tillerson, Secretary of State. Uh, the U.S. has direct channels to North Korea, meaning the U.S. is talking to North Korea, direct channels. Now, that's, that's really good. I mean, you know, it's good to talk. Unfortunately, the next day, Trump said, we have no direct channels. We don't want to talk to North Korea. We're not into that these days. So he totally, you know, dissed the Secretary of State, and plus it shows how inconsistent the policies are, which is a real danger when policies are inconsistent and your, quote, enemy doesn't really know what you're going to do. Uh, then this morning, you know, every day it's like, well, let me see what happened today in the White House or the Trump uh, place. You, you might gather, as I said, I'm a little bit to the left of, uh, of everybody. And so what came on television this morning, a direct quote, is that Tillerson said, Trump is a friggin' moron. <laughs> okay, I'm not making this, is not a paraphrase. They had the person, the reporter on television showing. She didn't mention whether friggin' was spelled out fully or just the shortcut, but moron was in there. So this is not a good sign, obviously. Uh, Mickey Haley at the UN has said, uh, we have to turn things over to Mattis, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, we're really out of discussion points. There's not much more to discuss. So now we have a particularly brand new real problem, I think, is that everyone has been saying prior to today that N Mickey Haley, Nikki Haley, has made very strong, you know, way right-wing statements while she was the UN ambassador. She is the UN ambassador. And that she's been preparing herself to take over for Tillerson when he leaves. Well, if Tillerson is forced out or resigns, uh, Nikki Haley will probably become the next Secretary of State, and she's to the right of Tillerson, I, su I suggest. Okay, so this is some of the stuff that's going on today. Uh, they, they, uh, they said that they had uh, exploded a hydrogen bomb. North Korea had exploded a hydrogen bomb in retaliation for the extreme sanctions that we put on their country. Well, these sanctions, even before the new sanctions were, I'll, I'll read the UN statement, was that over half the population lacks sufficient food and medical care, while a quarter suffers from chronic malnutrition. Okay. And so we're talking about escalating that. It's as if only Kim Jong-un is the only person in Korea. You know, we've talked about possibly doing preemptive nuclear strikes even. Again, 25 million people, but they don't count. Kim, Kim Jong-un is the only one that is somehow responsible for everything, and we don't care about the rest of the people. I'd like to go through a couple of things in terms of how, how uh, military and civilians view the possibilities. What is one of the things that maybe we look at is what is called the order, order of battle. I don't know if you're familiar with that. What the order of battle means is I have an army, you have an army, that I will assign a certain number of individuals to look at what do the generals on the other side, what books have they written, how many vacations do they take, how many children, where have they lived, what's their education, what the battles have they fought in before if they were in the World War I as an example. <coughs> so that's the order of battle. The other side does the same thing in trying to gauge what will the opposing army possibly do. This is, you know, something that uh, you may have seen, those of you, how many have seen Patton, the movie Patton, do you remember? 
Okay, and, and well, and in the movie, there is a point where the German high command is, is portrayed, and there's a, a lieutenant who goes and tries to tell the generals about Patton and what his proclivities are, and that he imagines himself at times, you know, going back to Roman times and being a great warrior, which should inform what will happen. Well, th that would be someone who's in charge of order of battle. Okay, so, so these are, that's a, a very difficult thing if you don't know what the other side is doing, you have zero confidence in that what you will be doing will be correct. How will it be perceived by the other side? And Trump is, is not able to keep a straight line with his own people, let alone himself, and Kim Jong-un is also someone who does not seem to be capable of, of dealing in a reasonable, what we would consider a reasonable fashion. We should remember, of course, that uh, he has seen what happens to people who give up their nuclear weapons, right? Yes. He has seen what happens in uh, Iraq, where Saddam gave up nuclear weapons, he has seen what happened in other countries when they have stopped doing things with nuclear wise. We've complained that he is going to set off a hydrogen bomb test in the atmosphere. Well, that's not good. You know, obviously it pollutes, this will be in the Pacific, that's going to be pretty bad. But maybe we look at back in history a little bit that in the 50s and 60s, we exploded approximately a hundred hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere. And that was okay. But he wants to do it, that's not okay. Well, we have the power, as, as was indicated. You know, and power gives you certain mights. The other, the other thing maybe to look at also in terms of uh, possibilities of war is what we call the terms of engagement. Terms of engagement, may, it's not a marriage proposal, but uh, the engagement is, is in terms of each army or each division or each corps, whatever the, the level is, they want to set the, the plan for how the battle will go. They want to set the battlefield. As a simple example would be, uh, if there's soldiers and one army on both sides of a valley, you don't want to be walking down the middle of that valley. You want to change the terms of engagement, maybe go around their flank and force them to move. Well. What have we done? And this is maybe the most critical thing, I think, that comes out of all of this. What, what have we done in terms of, terms of engagement? What our side basically has said is that we're not going to attack you. We're not going to attack you if you, but, but if you do anything at all that we don't like, then we'll attack you. So now, where is the power of starting a war resting? We've given the terms of engagement over to the North Koreans, that they can decide to attack or not to attack, to attack tomorrow, whatever they want to do, they can do, we're going to be reactive to that. That's not a good plan. That's not a good policy. Uh, and we can see that there is a, quite a hawkish uh, a lot of hawkish people going on in, in there. Uh, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster said that the White House is considering all options, including preventative war, as I said previously. The UN considers preventative war not possible, that there's no such thing as a legal preventative war. It might be looked upon as war crimes. Senator Lindsey Graham stated, if there's, and this is all within the last month or two, is that two minutes or no? Okay. Lindsey Graham's, uh, Graham, Republican of South Carolina, said if there's going to be a war to stop Kim Jong-un, it will be over there. If thousands die, they're going to die over there. They're not going to die here. And Trump has told me that to my face. This is Lindsey Graham. Uh, so the situation is not looking very good. Uh, Michael Moore, just about two weeks ago on Amy Goodman, Democracy Now!, he's the one who predicted, by the way, that Trump would win the election six months before Trump was even nominated. Okay, he has said he's sure that we will go to war with North Korea. So that, that's a really, really tough news. Uh, as was mentioned, there's a lot of military weaponry along that DMZ. I, I was stationed just about 20 miles or 15 miles from the DMZ. 
DMZ stands for Demilitarized Zone, where the North Koreans are on one side, we're on the other side. And uh, uh, the unintended consequence is that's one of the great uh, Southeast Asia native, uh, animal preserves because no one goes in there. And so the animals have free, free reign to procreate, I guess. Okay. But uh, so we're, we're standing there. There's only approximately 10,000 troops, American troops on DMZ. I was in the uh, 7th Division Headquarters uh, Operations. Operations is the ones who determine how to fight a battle, where the troops will go, where the, uh, the uh, enemy opposing is probably to come. <clears throat> and our, our, our task was to hold to the last person. Okay, so what that means is you're gonna have about 50% minimum casualties, dead or missing in action. And that, that was to try and hold the North Koreans from coming across. Well, right now, we only have about roughly 10,000 on the DMZ, 10 to 12,000. We have another 12, 15,000 throughout Korea, but not right on the demilitarized zone. So clearly, if, if a battle was to start, a war was to start, the North Korean troops know that where the Americans are. I mean, I went there and I, you could look through these tank telescopes and, and watch the North Koreans watching you. So that's sort of a strange thing, take pictures through the lens camera. And so if they attack, they, they have a massive amount of troops, massive amount of formal regular artillery, not nuclear weapons, which they have also, we know, but regular artillery, which can reach Seoul. And the, out, all of Seoul has about 20 million people. When I was there, the tallest building left from the Korean War was a six-story hotel. Everything else was knocked down or destroyed. So uh, if, if there were to be another invasion, Seoul would cease pretty much to exist. People, thank you, people estimate that there would only be, well, not only be, but there would be a minimum of two million, three million casualties. Okay. And if it's nuclear, of course, the, the limit is open. As Ron mentioned, there was talk about uh, creating a, uh, a cordon sanitaire dropping nuclear bombs uh, north of the 38th parallel from coast to coast. And so the radioactivity and everything would, of course, mean that no one could cross into that. That was discussed. Uh, and so today, you're really facing a large, large risk of going to war with North Korea and it, uh, escalating into a nuclear war. As Ron said, we may be going we may look at China as our big adversary, but if it happens in North Korea, it doesn't matter what the long range goal with China is. So it's really up to you guys to, to take action and not to wait. What uh, Michael, Moore, uh, Michael Moore said, once the war starts, we have to get out in the street. I suggest that's, that's too late. If the time to get out in the street is now, next week, next month, as soon as the better, and to make your Make your, your voice heard. Go to your senators, your congresspeople, and tell them that no, you don't want a war. You want to be able to have discussions. That's, that's what diplomacy is about, to have discussions to try and come up to some modus vivendi. Well, thank you very much. My time is up, and it's your, your turn to ask any of us could I, could I just yeah. add a couple oh, sure, of please. points which, yeah. uh, about military strategy? When you were talking, uh, Dan, a couple of points occurred to me which are important. You know, um, <clears throat> it's very difficult to root out a, a well-established uh, revolutionary movement. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Rec has recognized that, so its, it's second line of approach, shown in both Korea and Vietnam, it's been to, to, to extract so much damage and so much pain upon that uh, society that there'd be no interest in repeating that, ex it, 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 that, ex that experience elsewhere. And that's very consciously a pro. We, we may, may not be able to win, but we, be, we can make, the, uh, we make it so painful that no one else will want to follow this path. And that certainly is evident in both of those uh, places. The second point which I'd like to make is that 
You know, the U.S. could, it's well known, the U.S. could achieve quite a bit by, uh, by uh, diplomacy and negotiation. Why won't it do so? Why does it consistently refuse not to do so? Well, there's an important reason here. An imperial system rests a great deal upon reputation, upon reputation for toughness, and upon the, the idea that you cannot get anything from the, imperial, uh, uh, from the imperial system by resisting it. So the U.S. wants to establish that North Korea isn't going to get anything out of the U.S. by, uh, uh, by, its, uh, by its resisting behavior. <coughs> that is why it refuses, in my mind, that is why it refuses to negotiate, even though it's quite obvious that, it could, that uh, quite a bit could be achieved by negotiation. And in, in general, imperial systems have been resistant to negotiation because they want to establish their, uh, their reputation for toughness and for not giving in to, uh, uh, to uh, but, but we did say we did say we would negotiate as soon as they gave in to everything we want them to do they'll negotiate oh what a deal uh, the uh, the uh, the second the third point I want to third point I want to make is that you know uh, I believe that the main strategy of the US in Korea is is determined by its relations with Russia and China and that Korea is a a, a, a sideshow basically however it's important to note that uh, that strategies aren't always in control and you have to be remember the situation of World War one in which a, an assassination in the Balkans a very side uh, a very uh, a ter tertiary peripheral event ended up in triggering a calamity which destabilized all of Europe and much of the uh, world. That could happen again, even if, the, as I believe it is, the main intention of the U.S. is to restrain Russia and uh, China. Bear that in mind. Now, one quick additional point is the people in South Korea, the new president in South Korea was elected on the idea of eventual reunification. That was what he wanted to accomplish. And it would have to be a long transition period. But he, you know, was focusing on that because the Korean people are one people. The North-South is just a, a border that somebody created that doesn't make, have any real import, okay? And the South Korean president was opposed to the imposition of U.S. anti-ballistic missiles in South Korea. Until Kim in the North really became very confrontational and was conducting more nuclear tests and launching more ballistic missiles, then he said, okay, we'll take those missiles and give us some more. Uh, but the people in South Korea and the people in North Korea, just like the people in Vietnam, were one people. They didn't want to be divided. This was something that outside forces imposed upon them and uh, it's had devastating impact on the people of both of these nations. So we'd like to hear from you now if you have some questions or comments or discussion. If you try and keep it brief though because we do need to get out here and there are a number of people here so uh, We'll try and keep it to maybe a minute or so. Yes. So I heard about this um, defector that was in the U.S. for five years and turned to somebody and said, I can't believe, uh, from North Korea, that you have the ability to love another person more than your leader. And it was after five years here that, that that's one of the you know, great learnings that he had coming here. Can you talk a little bit about the people of North Korea and, and their, their psyche, their attitude towards? Now, the, initially, the, the first member of the Kim dynasty, the one who was the guerrilla leader, Kim Il-sung, uh, he was revered as almost like a godlike figure in North Korea. He was a very skillful politician, and he knew how. He was also Christian, and his father was a Methodist minister. Uh, he knew how to use 
uh, techniques to convince people. And so the North Korean people, because of his long opposition to the Japanese, uh, the North Korean people were willing to do whatever and to sacrifice basically whatever was necessary uh, because Kim said so. His son, one of his sons then took over uh, after he died and the uh, feelings lessened. Uh, they, there was still strong support, but not the same <coughs> way. I mean, the son was not viewed, you know, as a deity. Uh, and now the, the grandson uh, the, it's far less support, but there's still the first Kim, Kim Il-sung, created the idea of self-sufficiency for North Korea and not to rely on other nations. And I think this is entrenched in the minds of the people in North Korea. So they're willing to sacrifice a lot and to undergo uh, major uh, suffering. In, in the 90s, the mid, early to mid 90s, there was a large famine that hit North Korea uh, and they lost millions of people during this period. Uh, this was now when the son was the ruler and uh, the people uh, know that you know, their goal is still to survive as a nation and not to give in and not to allow outside forces control them. Um, there's the political situation is not good. You don't have political rights to oppose the administration. Uh, but the situation is not as horrific as our media leads us to believe. I recently, in late August, there was a show on CNN, which I happened to be flipping through, and it was from Paul Yang, the Paul Yang, the capital of North Korea. And it was a CNN reporter uh, talking to American tourists who were rushing to get into North Korea before September 1st, because in September 1st, the sanctions were going to take effect that U.S. citizens couldn't go to North Korea. And they had the city skyline in the background, modern high-rise buildings, well-laid-out streets and things, very different. Bruce Cummings is a... Uh, noted historian uh, and he's married to a Korean woman and he's written a number of books on North Korea and he's visited North Korea numerous times and you know he gives a very different perspective on what life is like but life is going to get harsher and harsher because of these ongoing sanctions uh, you don't have political rights but if you keep your head down, just like in Iraq, you didn't have political rights, but if you kept your head down, you would probably do okay. I mean, Iraq was a, basically, uh, you had free health care, free education, women were highly thought of professionals. Uh, you know, it was a very modern country in many regards. It was a rich country because it had water and oil both. North Korea is not a rich country, but it does have a lot of minerals that are very valuable and it has a lot of coal uh, that it uses for creating uh, income to the country. Uh, sanctions are really putting severe pressure on the population of North Korea now, and it's going to get tougher because the United States has told other countries that if you support North Korean companies and do business with North Korean banks, forget about doing business with the United States. So no country wants to trade North Korea for the United States in terms of business opportunities. Uh, you know, I would add to what Ron has said, you know, the, tr the historical tradition of Korea's monarchy and, uh, uh, and there's also a very strong uh, cultural e emphasis upon family unity. So the, the, tr the transition from father to son is not really very far off from the historical uh, traditions of Korea. It's not, a it's not nearly as alien as it might appear, you know, from the, uh, from the U.S. Uh, vantage point. And the, uh, so that uh, 
it's, if you think about it, the U.S. wants to present this as, a, as an extremely pathological kind of thing, which is unheard of, but it's not the case at all. It, it's really fairly congenial with the, with the uh, culture and historical background of Korea. Thank you. Other questions? In the back? <coughs> Leslie. Um, I'm wondering if you go a little more into relations between Korea and North Korea and China and or Russia, like when you said like there was a famine in the night, it's like, I mean, did the Chinese or the Russians try to help? Or, or are there, you know, was there economic supports between them? Um, and, and if so, and then you just mentioned the sanctions, has that you know, how was that affecting relations between North Korea, China, Russia, and the United States, and the United States relations with China? North Korea, as Tom mentioned, Korean forces fought in the in China against the Japanese occupation, uh, and then a lot of them also stay there and some fought for Mao, many fought for Mao and a few <laughs> fought for Chiang Kai-shek but the great majority fought for Mao and Mao appreciated that loyalty and the, the, their fighting allowed, helped him to overtake Chiang's forces. So during the Korean War period when the UN police action had driven the North Korean forces back to the Yalu River, which is the boundary between North Korea or between Korea, China, and the Soviet Union. Uh, China said, we don't want to have uh, hostile forces on our border. So that's when China came up with uh, a million volunteers to go and help drive the UN, US forces back away from the Yalu River. Uh, that's one of the times MacArthur wanted to use the A-bomb and to create that uh, boundary, nuclear destroyed boundary between. Uh, but um, China really, for a long time, then didn't do much with regard to North Korea. And the Soviet Union was opposed to the uh, Korean War uh, didn't want to see North Korea to uh, invade uh, or have this incursion. Uh, but of late, uh, the Soviet Union and China both have been doing, and China I think has been a major trading partner for the South, uh, for the North Koreans. Uh, but the sanctions now, uh, China is backed way away from this because of the threat uh, U.S. business or North Korean business, uh, and the Soviet or Russia now is backed away too. So they are not as supportive, and Russia is not buying as much of the minerals and things or the coal uh, from North Korea that they had. So they are l much less supportive. They have they tried to work out a, a new piece of negotiations, and Russia and China have put together along with uh, North Korea uh, negotiations based on the idea of a freeze for freeze. North Korea would freeze any nuclear, additional nuclear development. It would freeze all its ballistic missile work uh, in exchange for elimination of the war games elimination of the sanctions, elimination of the threats to use nuclear weapons against the North, and get the U.S. troops out of Korea. Yeah, along with that is uh, what China is not that interested really in North Korea as a North Korean viable country, except for the fact that they understand if the North became part of the South, let's say the South took over, then you would have troops that are inimical to them right on the border on the Yalu River. And so they also fear, China would fear that, what if the Americans set up also troops and missile sites and what have you right there on the Yalu River. So that's one of the reasons they haven't really gone after 
uh, Korea, North Korea, with sanctions as much as the United States would want. We, we want them to double down and triple down on sanctions to just strangle them. And uh, China has been leery of doing that, although now they've come along with the UN resolution. The question is, are they really going to abide by it? or will they underground it because they don't want to see South Korea or the United States on their border? You know, but um, um, uh, if China, if Korea were unified and the U.S. troops got out of there, then China would probably be uh, quite happy about the, that kind of situation because it would give them a much, uh, a much uh, stronger trading partner. But as long as the U.S. Uh, is, is in there and as long as the unification means ch U.S. troops on the border of China, China is going to uh, uh, oppose it for sure. But with regard to the famine which you mentioned, uh, Leslie, uh, it, at the time of the famine, 1994-1995, uh, Russia was a greatly weakened position. It was an economic crisis itself, and so it couldn't help very much. Uh, China did try to to, uh, to help somewhat. However, the, the famine situation was made much more difficult by the fact that there was very bad flooding uh, in the, uh, at the same time as there was a, a, a problem with energy that the, the um, uh, North Korean uh, agriculture was based very much on energy-intensive uh, energy fertilizers and with the growth, with the rise in the price of energy that became impossible to, to uh, to, uh, fun, to fund those f uh, uh, fertilizers, and uh, but with the uh, uh, um, but with the flooding made it much more difficult to provide immediate uh, uh, assistance in the way as it happened. But uh, China certainly did try to provide some help at that time. Yeah. Um, a couple things, um, Dan, when you were talking about the air test of the North Korean weapon. Um, would that follow, do you think that would follow the same trajectory of the last missile that they fired over Japan? That I had heard that that was, seemed like that would be the logical place to fire kind of into the same area that the U.S. tested, but that would involve actually flying a warhead over Japan. Well, the, the, no one really knows for sure until it's done, but that would be a very dangerous situation because the question would be, well, what if it fell short and instead of overflying Japan, it landed in the Japanese city. Right. That would be a real problem. Yeah. And, and then, um, can any of you tell me, from North Korea, um, they want unification, is that correct? They want unification on their terms. Okay, so that's what I was gonna ask. So yeah. what are the North Korean terms, and then do you have any knowledge of how the people of the South, from polling, how the people of the South feel about Unification on the North's terms. I don't think uh, the Koreans as a whole every want uh, want unification. The question is, what would be the terms of those uh, y unifications? I think uh, the only reasonable way which it could possibly happen would be uh, would be if there were number one a, a, a demilitarization of the entire uh, country. Neither side is going to agree, you know, to. Uh, to unification if it means occupation by the uh, other sides. It would have to mean a mixed kind of, uh, of economy, which recognizes aspects of, uh, of uh, both of those economies. It would have to be some kind of a, 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 a democratic system, which acknowledges the possibility of, of both sides. Uh, in the population, uh, uh, South Korea is about twice the population of North Korea. South Korea is about uh, in the neighborhood of 50 million North Koreas, in the neighborhood of 25 million, I might be a little bit off on that, but that's that's approximately what the uh, uh, so that's that's an issue. But the overwhelming wish of it's very clear of the Korean people is for uh, e e unification. They feel themselves as being very much uh, uh, one people. They feel it's a foreign imposition that divided them, but uh, it, the unification is been extremely uh, 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 difficult because the interests of the great powers and their uh, proxies are, are, does not favor that. The, uh, yes. Is there an idea of what the tipping point might be that would out have that happen? There's no Berlin Wall to come down to? Well, I think mainly it's the U.S. decision. 
uh, the Korean people don't really have much voice. Uh, as long as our troops are there, uh, I mean, uh, we see it benefits us because, you know, from the perspective that we're concerned about China more than North Korea, uh, our troops being there causes concern to China. Uh, it also allows us to have weapons there, and now these new uh, ballistic, anti-ballistic missiles weapons are there. Uh, if, if, as Tom said, if the nation were unified, uh, there would be no reason for the U.S. forces to be there. And that would weaken us in terms of China as our target. We want to have forces close by that, you know, causes China some concern. So I don't, I don't think, if, if the Korean people really all, you know, rose up, then the Korean people would have a voice. And, you know, it'd be hard just from a, a PR perspective for the United States to try and stop that. But it's hard uh, to s imagine a situation where that would occur right now. What uh, the, the incoming, or the new South Korean president had talked about was initially there's a, an economic zone in North Korea that had been used uh, South Korea put some factories in there and North Korea provided the, fa the workers for those factories. And this was a situation that went on for a number of years. This was under previous presidents of South Korea who were trying to push the idea of unifying the country. Uh, and that was a first step toward that. And the incoming South Korean president had talked about doing that uh, but again, now the belligerent talk from Kim in the north, uh, as well as the belligerent talk from Trump and, you know, the schoolyard behavior uh, has put a stop to that. So, but that would be, you know, a type of, that would be a type of step that would be part of the transition between uh, two separate countries and a single nation. You'd start with small steps like that and build from there, I think. I think the most likely tipping point would be a, North, a South Korean government which asks the U.S. to leave mil militarily. Uh, that would take quite a change from what exists at the moment, but I think that if you ask me what could most likely happen, that's what I think is the best chance, though I wouldn't say it's a huge chance. Yeah, and I think we really need to end it right here because... Well, we have another three minutes, right? Two more questions, maybe? If we have... Yeah, could you... I came in late, so if you've already spoken to this, just tell me something. But I, I'd like to ask a question about just the total hypocrisy of the U.S. and its nuclear weapons and its failure to even follow the existing international treaties, such as the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which mandate the U.S. to get rid of its own weapons. And, and yet, it, it constantly plays this game of no one else can break that treaty or no one else can, uh, you know, like Iran or whatever, and, or Israel or... Um, so, I don't know what, I'll just... Well, you, you, know that, you know that the U.S. is infected with the idea of exceptionalism. We're different. We don't have to obey by the rules by, uh, by other countries. They did sign that. And, the, um, uh, and, uh, and the, 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 I think the, the, the reason for that, they believe, honestly, I think, that the alternative to U.S. dominance is, is world chaos. And that's, that's the, uh, and therefore they feel justified in being exceptional, because I think if, they were, if we weren't the dominant power, then God knows what would happen in this world, it would go to pot. And the, of course, I don't think that, but I think that's the meaning of the doctrine of exceptionalism. The U.S. doesn't have to obey. Do the U.S. can afford to be uh, hypo hypocritical. Do you have a question? I just wanted to say before people leave, and we have to be out of here in five minutes, so we might be able to take one more question. Uh, my library person just came and told me, but. So I think the question is, so what, what can we do? What's our role in this? Because as we know, there are um, 
there are forces within the U.S. government and the military and the Congress and the uh, intelligence community that want war because it makes money for these military contractors and they want control over uh, resources around the world and they want to control what happens with other countries. So what can we do? I, on this page I handed out, there's several things at the bottom that you can do. And I want to just mention that every Saturday we stand on the corner of Canyon and Broadway and hold signs, you know, no war on North Korea. There are many other things you can do. You can write letters, you can call your Congress people. If you sign up for our email list, we will uh, give you things, you know, to do, to do as well. Uh, there's national days of action, there's petitions to sign. So uh, these the people in power do not stop wars. They start wars. And so it's only the pressure of the grassroots that will stop wars. And war is a horrific thing for, for people. I mean, millions of people die, children die, a animals die. I mean, it's just beyond belief. So it's up to us to stop war because they're not going to do it. And so please get involved with us. If we have a group that works on this if you have time or just do something on your own or get a group started where you are. We'd love to get a group started on campus so of anti-war groups. So if there's anyone here that is interested in that, just give me a call. My email's my phone number's on here, my email's on here as well. But I think I think it's important when you go to know we're not helpless in this, we play a role. We're the only thing that ever stops wars, the people, really. Carolyn mentioned that on October 21st, we're having an event at, at CU, uh, uh, at, uh, um, in Engineering 105 about how to establish peace with North Korea by a, a peacemaker who's been there four times and written a book about it, Eric Sorotkin. Yeah. And we have to be out of here. <laughs> yes, not students. Yet, not yet. You, have you have a voice, and you can write letters to the editor and contribute those to the local papers to let the congressional representatives and senators understand that there is strong opposition. So you should be great at doing that, given your training now, the classes you're taking. So go at it. <laughs>